Yeah, great. Okay, wonderful. Uh, welcome everyone to uh, this next um, lecture on Sichuan religions. Um, and uh, I am here with uh, my co-director Stefania Travanin and with Dr. Lars Vaman. Um, we are very excited today to move from, um, uh, we've so far we've uh, uh, covered uh, Buddhism, Taoism and popular religions in China. We're now moving to uh, Catholicism, which is exciting. Um, and so I want to introduce to you Dr. Laman. Lars Peter Laman is a senior lecturer in the history of China at the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London, where he also received his PhD. Uh, Lars is the editor in chief of the Central Asiatic Journal and director of the Center of World Christianity at SOAS. Um, apart from a growing fascination with the language, culture, and history of the Manchus, his research interest, in, interest also focused on the interface between medicine and popular religion. And he has shown this um, in many of his publications. He's also interested, uh, of course, in late imperial Chinese Christianity. His publications reflect this variety of emphases. Um, for example, uh, he published Narcotic Culture, A History of Drugs in China with Frank T. Carter and Zhou Xun. Uh, he uh, also Christian Heretics in Late Imperial China, uh, Critical Readings on the Manchus of Modern China, uh, and The Church as a Safe Haven, Christian Governments in China. So as you can see, a real variety uh, of topics that he covers. He also, this is also reflected in his teaching. Uh, at SOAS, and uh, he also has uh, several PhD students studying in all of these uh, uh, related fields. Uh, so without further ado, please welcome Dr. Laman uh, and his talk. Thank you very much uh, for uh, gathering around this screen, um, whether it's morning or evening for you or in the middle of the day. Uh, I'm going to share my screen now, but I'm going to uh, I just want to welcome you from straight from the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London on a sunny afternoon. Um, and the topic of today's session is this one. I'm going to enlarge this so you should be able to see a, a large screen now, uh, a large yeah, Yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes. Um, <clears throat> With our logo on it. Wonderful. Of course, <laughs> the, um, it's an adapted talk from one that I gave in, um, in Leipzig at the uh, European Association for Chinese Studies, uh, but it's actually, uh, it has matured a little bit, and th this is uh, an indication that this project is something that I've been dealing with for a number of years now. Um, it was meant to have been concluded by now uh, and uh, um, been turned into a book which uh, for which I've already got the contract and everything but of course uh, COVID put a stop to all of this this is a temporary stop I hope but it's a, a very effective one because um, uh, the archives that I'm going to mention at the very end they were uh, off limits uh, completely and I have uh, too many open uh, questions that I needed to answer. I could not have uh, done this online. I could not have done this any other way. So um, uh, th there will be a book ba based on my findings in Sichuan and also some other related uh, places such as uh, Wuhan. But um, the um, uh, interesting thing about Sichuan for me personally is that it's the very first place that I encountered in China. It was where I passed my 23rd birthday um, 22nd of September 1986, and 86, um, for those of you who are, uh, remember that time, was the first year when you could actually uh, travel in China as a, um, um, an individual tourist, uh, so not a part of an organized tour, and uh, this is when I visited several of the places that um, are, uh, I'm going to mention today, I, uh, not, not in great depth, but uh, so I'm going to uh, show you pictures such as this one, uh, taken in by Lujan, but this is a, uh, an archival picture. This is from the, uh, the internet. Um, I took pictures myself, but those, that was in the time before, the, um, before there was any um, 
uh, digital uh, cameras or even mobile phones uh, in existence. And I have, I remember a beautiful black and white picture that I took um, uh, and uh, developed, but um, I, I, to be honest, I don't even know where it is, but it's, I'm glad that the facade is still there of that church. Um, and uh, uh, in those days, it was actually illegal. 1986, it was illegal to be in uh, uh, places outside cities. So, so there was actually a city limit. So uh, many of the um, places that I visited on foot, um, I, I uh, visited um, at my own peril. And um, in one case, but that was not a church, that was a, a Buddhist monastery. I was actually taken, um, uh, well, I became the guest of a, a police station for a, a few nights um, because in theory I had violated the, the law of the People's Republic of China, so uh, uh, they had to arrest me, but they didn't want to say anything in that direction, so they just said that the hotel where I was staying was not good enough for a foreign visitor, so I had to stay in a um, uh, in in a, a cell, which was very a very comfortable cell, I must say, but that was my twenty third birthday. Anyway, so back to the present and back to uh, actually back into the past. So um, uh, what I was going to emphasize in today's session is actually, as you can find in the title, reflected in the title, that many of the um, much of the evidence that we have of the um, uh, in the archives in the records on uh, life in the Christian communities in China. It deals with small towns, small communities, and not just that, but also with churches that are not really churches, because that's the big contradiction. The, as much as the um, uh, countryside today in China is, so Baibujan is uh, outside Chengdu, uh, it's in a place which is, um, um, I thought I remember, Pengzhou, maybe Pengzhou, um, uh, where you can check this later, but um, uh, so it's not far away from Chengdu, uh, where churches of imposing structures are uh, presenting themselves to us today. Yet the majority of the, uh, the um, churches that, are, that you find or the Christian life that you find in the archives are not at all uh, in uh, centers where you could, uh, identify a missionary station or even a, a visible church. But more about that later. So it's this is one of the contradictions which I tried to get to the bottom uh, of in, in my research on the uh, a, a Christian communities in, um, uh, in Sichuan. Of course, I'm doing this in the context of the, um, uh, the uh, uh, project, research project, which is um, uh, funded by the Jiang Jingguo Foundation uh, uh, on religious life, the religious history of, uh, of Sichuan province. So uh, th this fits in very well, very naturally, very uh, organically into my own interests. And I was very happy to be included in this project. For those of you who are uh, outsiders, when it comes to um, history, the history of uh, Christianity in, uh, in Sichuan, um, it, or even in China, um, the history of Christianity in China can be traced back to uh, centuries, which are quite literally at the beginning of anything that we can uh, call China, at least in the very modern sense, in the imperial sense. It takes us back, as you can find in the central picture that you have, um, it takes us back to the boundary of uh, uh, Central Asia and uh, the Chinese areas or the areas which are settled by Chinese agrarian populations. Uh, this is Pocho or uh, Gaochang, um, Karahoya, uh, Karahoya it's called in, uh, in um, uh, Turkic, in Kazakhi. So we're just on the boundary between uh, uh, historical China and historical Central Asia. Asia and of course it's in the um, uh, the 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 central eastern part of uh, of Xinjiang, but this is a picture that shows you uh, uh, an image of the um, Syriac Eastern Church, also known as the Nestorian Church. Um, this is a religious procession, and uh, this is being addressed by a um, a, a priest. Uh, this does take us back uh, uh, quite some time. It takes us back into the um, uh, the, the Weijin period, so before 
between the um, Han and the Tang period. So it's a, a, a very um, a stark reminder that Christianity has been with us for a very long time, almost as long as imperial China can be traced back to it. We take it back to the uh, Han, Qin Han period. So, uh, and this by coincidence as well, uh, during the uh, high tide of um, uh, China's Buddhification, the um, entrance of uh, uh, the entry of Buddhism into China. However, um, and, and the images to the left and to the right, are of course, much, much later. So these are uh, Mingqing uh, uh, illustrations that you uh, will find uh, uh, in any textbook that deals with uh, the history of China. And uh, this is what we usually assume um, uh, Christianity in China to look like, namely uh, the direct consequence of the uh, efforts that the um, uh, that, that uh, religious orders, missionary orders, such as the um, uh, uh, Jesuits had left behind. But uh, for China as a whole, this is not the case. But Sichuan is different. Why is it different? Because, well, strictly speaking, not all of Sichuan is in China. And uh, I don't want to um, make a political point out of this, but it's in historical terms, we are on the boundary between uh, the, uh, the Sinic world, so the Chinese world, and a world which is dominated by um, ethnic communities that are either uh, beyond the, uh, the boundaries of the Chinese empires at that point, especially towards the south, that, that is the case, or that belong to the Tibetan realm and uh, Tibetan Tangut realm. So uh, this is a boundary uh, of civilizations. And I think uh, the uh, historical uh, insert on the left shows this very clearly. This is, of course, taken uh, from the um, uh, Chang Guo Shu Dai. So this is from the uh, Warring States period. Uh, but you can see that the um, uh, Sichuan Basin is outside the state of Chu. Chu, which is even in the, if you look at the um, uh, Chongqiu uh, and uh, other uh, early historical uh, writings, even that uh, uh, case can be argued to be a, a borderline a twilight zone area of Chinese civilization because they had absorbed so many um, uh, non-Chinese uh, features in their cultural uh, uh, lives. But um, Sichuan was clearly outside that. Um, in the larger uh, picture, and that's what the right-hand side shows you, we are uh, on the um, boundary between uh, what, what you could describe as uh, the Eastern Indian world and uh, Southeast Asia. And of course, also China. So this is not uh, trying to belittle the influence of China, but it is on the boundary. And this meant that for the, um, uh, the Nestorian Christians, for the um, old Christians in China, Sichuan was not interesting because it was simply not wealthy enough and the protectors, they were far away from the, their own protectors, namely the, um, the imperial uh, families, imperial dynasties that had actually uh, uh, issued orders that, um, that the, uh, uh, the uh, Jingyao, as it was known, the uh, Eastern uh, Church, the Eastern Orthodox Church was protected within the empires. And this is something that you get right into the um, uh, Yuan period, so into, into the uh, Mongol period. So uh, first a few images before I really start talking. So th these are, uh, this is a church that, that I did not visit, but um, I, I, um, I have heard uh, a lot about it, I read a lot about it. This is a, a very good example of hybrid um, uh, Chinese uh, and Baroque European architecture. Um, for some reason, I always, think that this is has something Mexican in it, but um, uh, you have to uh, uh, ask me at another point uh, uh, why I uh, think that. Um, maybe because I've been to Mexico too often, but uh, it's um, a, a, there is something which shows that the, um, uh, the, the Asian and the European uh, form something that is really unique. It's uh, the Wuzhou Catholic Church, Zhen Yuantang inside, you get the same uh, hybrid nature, which um, sh shows itself in the um, uh, architecture. 
And of course, you can also get this um, in other churches. That's not belittling it, but um, it's the, the combination with the facade, which is which is clearly uh, uh, which clearly shows that it's uh, something unique. Uh, other uh, examples of hybrid architecture is, for example, this church, Moshi Moshi uh, uh, where uh, you can see that uh, uh, there are features which are uh, could have been taken in a Western church anywhere in Europe or in the uh, European sphere, uh, but um, the added features that you find on top, they make it a clear case of a Chinese church, or you would think it is Chinese if it were not for the fact that you have so many minorities, ethnic minorities in, um, in Sichuan, but to that point more later. So here's another church, it's the uh, 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 Yuan Tung uh, Church, Yuan Tung Zhen, um, uh, and very clearly marked as Tian Zhu Jiao with a cross on top, crucifix on top. <clears throat> uh, so so th this is the Zhong Ning Zhu Zhu Zhong. So th again, th it uh, gives a, um, uh, it marks when you look at the architectural features, a, a perfect uh, hybrid state between uh, what you would describe as a, um, a Chinese and a Western um, place of worship. This one, I can tell you much more about, uh, uh, maybe after the session, or uh, you know, perhaps if we have time at the very end, um, uh, in Baoxingxian, uh, uh, where you have the legacy of the um, church that was built, a church that was built by uh, Armand David. Um, and uh, this uh, uh, church, of course, uh, is from the outside a perfect monastery, uh, almost like a Buddhist monastery. Inside, it retains European features, but the important thing is that uh, the uh, significance of this place is goes far beyond anything that is normally defined by a missionary station. So you could say that uh, uh, David had at this point almost assumed the uh, so in the early 19th century, before, much before the, um, uh, the um, uh, Westerners were accorded the status of uh, uh, welcome settlers inside the Qing Empire, it had, uh, he had become a, um, uh, almost a saint to them. A very, uh, uh, he had obtained a very high po uh, position in local society, which he has until today. So this is a very interesting place to visit if you, if you have the time. A different, um, uh, a, a different uh, type of church you get, a much more European type, you get in, uh, uh, in the center of Chengdu uh, by the uh, Pingan, Chao, Pingan Bridge, uh, Peace Bridge. And, um, uh, but uh, of course, uh, less interesting than the, um, uh, the uh, architectural features are those that deal, see the same church now, um, here in the front uh, are the uh, theological ones or uh, the ones that uh, de deal with um, uh, orthopraxy. So not orthodoxy, but orthopraxy. So how, how do uh, Christians interact with the main features of religious life? Um, you could simply argue, okay, this is a clear example of a Catholic church. So of course you have uh, the, uh, you have the Virgin Mary, uh, the Sacred Mother Mary uh, in the in the front, but there's something else going on. And those of you who are not familiar with uh, Christianity in China, uh, you might not know that uh, this is a uh, a, a point where uh, the, the traditional Chinese perceptions of uh, what uh, religion is supposed to do within society or within somebody's personal life and the um, uh, the features the um, hierarchies and also the um, also the political dimension of religious institutions uh, that they do not necessarily match those uh, of the West. And uh, I think this is a very uh, beautiful example because um, when we look at the, um, the role of uh, sacred uh, mothers in a Chinese uh, tradition, um, and I'm not a specialist in Buddhism nor in Taoism, but there are very, some very clear parallels. Um, uh, for example, the uh, uh, Guanyin Pusa, who's, um, uh, who has a, um, 
we have the um, uh, uh, Bodhisattva Guanyin, uh, who is actually uh, often depicted in this uh, in this in the same way as the uh, Virgin Mary, namely with the halo, with uh, a, um, a a complete um, uh, a completely uh, uh, almost re religious uh, tuna, a tunic around uh, uh, around her body, uh, and then also holding a child. And then uh, when you look at the evidence that we have from the Ming and Qing era, uh, you will find that many of the uh, shrines that are devoted to um, actually him, uh, the Bodhisattva Guan Yin, uh, uh, but by the late empire, this is definitely, uh, this uh, figure of devotion has definitely morphed into a female um, uh, phenotype. Um, if you focus on this, uh, you will see that um, the, uh, the connection between female fertility and worship of um, uh, the uh, Guan Yin uh, figure is is very much a uh, something that is um, uh, a, um, a a standard feature of a late imperial life and then you have the Wuxiang Lao Mu which is uh, to which to whom I can say uh, much more than, but uh, uh, that's perhaps where Buddhism and Taoism merge but uh, this lecture is meant to be uh, focusing on the the Christian uh, heritage of um, uh, th that you will find in uh, late imperial China, late Qin China, in fact. So mid, um, I have to, I corrected my title, it's actually more mid and late Qin than anything else, um, but um, uh, we're going to be looking at that in a moment. And then the last aspect where you can find the, um, uh, the sanctity of the female figure in, uh, especially in Sichuan, is when it comes to the uh, uh, the, the, the places where you have, uh, um, uh, well, um, uh, chaste um, young women, chaste young women, uh, and they're referred to in the Latin literature as the vocatas virgines. So it's the, um, the, uh, the, of course, the virgin, the, the non-married uh, women who are with a re religious calling. Um, and um, these women with a calling uh, we'll get back to in a little bit. Uh, of course, they are. Um, they often have their own motives for uh, for being isolated. Um, uh, nevertheless, uh, in this context, it's for the first time that we get the new generation of missionaries that enter. Um, uh, Martilia uh, has. Um, I mean, the, um, uh, when we get to the uh, Missions Etrangères, I'm going to say a little bit more about him. Uh, uh, Joaquin uh, 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 Jobert de Martilla is a, um, a very well-known figure who uh, had a, um, uh, who took over a, um, a set of rules for female orders, which uh, he took from uh, Luigi Maggi, um, uh, a, a, um, Dominican who had um, uh, designed this specifically for the uh, for the this phenomenon in Sichuan uh, of uh, areas of Christ of uh, locations for Christian women who did not want to get married. I, I leave it as simple as that, and the, the, that resulted in the so-called twenty-five rules, which um, every woman had to sign up to who wanted to enter this and. Um, Interestingly enough, that was also to make sure that uh, uh, you did not get um, uh, women who regretted being there. So it was a very, um, a very rigorous process of uh, selecting them. But more about them in a moment. So, but this is just a um, uh, an indication that it's not just the architecture that uh, merges in uh, provinces such as Sichuan, but definitely also the. Um, the theological side of the uh, uh, religious convictions that you have. Oops. So here we have we have the uh, the setting, the geographical setting for the the lecture today. Um, it's a map that you you need to get used to. Uh, it's um, uh, not precisely the Qing Empire. It's the Qing Empire plus, namely. Um, not even in the Fabankian sense, the, uh, the, the, the circles of uh, tributary nations, uh, but uh, states that the Qing Empire either incorporated over time 
or had some claim over or had specially good relations with. And uh, this uh, you would, uh, if you take the diagonal line that goes all the way from uh, uh, roughly Bombay, Mumbai, um, which just about, well, which was, was just about ex came into existence at that point, all the way up to, um, uh, yes, Sakhalin, which was the non-Manchu part of the, um, the of Manchuria, Sakhalian um, Alin, the, the Black Mountains, um, that, that stretch um, up here. Then you have quite literally half of Asia that you're dealing with. And lo and behold, Sichuan is right in the center of this. So this is um, uh, once more to show that uh, with Sichuan, you're on the margins of China, but you're right in the center of Asia. And this is a, um, um, a, a, a truth which brings with it certain consequences. And these consequences are usually to be found on an ethnic, but also on a, an interreligious uh, uh, level. This is, okay, Qianlong uh, Shirai, So this is the Qianlong uh, era. Uh, 1760, he would have been uh, already sort of in his, uh, at the end of his uh, younger years. Uh, and this is, of course, uh, uh, around the time when he launches uh, uh, into the Western Territory, Xi Yu, in order to subjugate them completely. From the same period of time, you have the um, uh, depictions that show all the populations, all the peoples who flock towards the Qing Empire in order to uh, show respect to the uh, Qing dynasty. The um, Qing dynasty is, of course, a, um, uh, a newcomer in, um, in terms of establishing uh, uh, a rule that uh, started already before the uh, conquest of Beijing. Uh, so uh, if, you, if we take the year 1644 as the beginning of uh, Qing rule over all of China, it's around that time that the Qing would have established themselves in uh, Sichuan. And these Westerners uh, would only very rarely have been met in Sichuan around this time. But um, I'm going to uh, give you a few names and dates that actually show that uh, uh, Westerners did make their way to Sichuan as well, but um, uh, they were on the margins. Further to the north, it was a different, and in the, the south, in uh, Guangzhou, um, even in uh, Fujian, it was a completely different story. So um, we have to shed the image of China as being isolated. Even in the Ming period, you have a lot of coming and going by Westerners, but in the uh, Qianlong era, uh, it, uh, the sight of Westerners was quite common. And this, um, uh, the, uh, the title that I've got here, it's, it's both in Manchu and in Chinese. It's the, it's the, it's the literally the, uh, the, the, those, uh, the people from, or the peoples from uh, uh, who uh, come to give uh, uh, tribute uh, from uh, the 10,000 places, so from all over the world, um, to, into, the, into the, 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 the great Qing Empire. So and the, the Chinese is a bit simpler. It's um, uh, Huang Qing, so the, uh, so the, the uh, uh, imperial uh, Qing, uh, so it's the, the map of the, um, of the, of the, of the tributary, tributaries, so the tributary peoples uh, to the uh, imperial Qing. Um, but um, th this is a special entry and it uh, shows some Westerners, um, namely not just any Westerners, it shows actually uh, clerics. And um, uh, you will see that, the, um, that, that both a male and a female specimen is on display, which is what this book is about because it's meant to show clothes, habits, also facial features um, of, um, uh, 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 of uh, Westerners, uh, but sorry, not just Westerners, of, of all the populations around uh, China and also belonging to uh, faraway places like Europe. 
but by this point we we're now entering the the core part of the 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 lecture namely uh what christianity catholicism in um uh, in uh, the, the Qing era was like and where it differs from other parts of china uh, so first one is what i mentioned in the beginning namely that uh, it is um, not an ancient uh, place for, um, for 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 christian uh, community so the the jingjiao the um, the, the Church of the East was not present in Sichuan, as far as we know. Um, it's too far away from the Silk Route, it was too far away from the centers of power. Um, so uh, the very first contacts with Christianity really begin in the uh, modern Catholic mission, um, namely in the last few years of the Ming, Ming Dynasty, so 1640, uh, 1640, around 1640 or in 1640. Um, of course, it's um, uh, the precise um, dates we only get when when we look at the um, uh, official documents that um, uh, that that survive. But 1640 is a guaranteed date. Um, namely, that is the date when Ludovico Bullio, um, and uh, Gabriel de uh, Magalhaes, Magalhaes, um, both Jesuits, uh, Andres, um, when they arrive in uh in uh Sichuan. and Sichuan, the places where the um where, where christian uh, places are being set up christian centers I, uh, i'm going to call them chrétienté in a little while but at that point uh, there are no french people so you we can't uh, call it like that um so where, where christian places are being established so small centers of of missionary um uh, activity with um uh, according to the figures that I found, uh, roughly 30 uh, converts initially in the year 1640. So it's a, a small group. Um, th that would have been in, uh, uh, in Chengdu, uh, but also in Baoning and Chongqing. Uh, so these three places come up again and again. And this is where the first missionaries, first Jesuits, were active as missionaries. These, so it's a case of missionary Christianity, not not an ancient uh, Christianity that somehow um, uh, persists um, as you get it in very few places in, uh, in, in China during this time. Uh, again, I leave this uh, to, to, uh, to the side uh, right now. Um, in the uh, following years, uh, we get a period of uh, uh, confusion and uh, in the following decades, of great bloodshed. Um, it's uh, what, what you can say, what you can keep in mind from this early period is that the um, few centers of Christianity that develop, that they take refuge in areas where they feel safe. And these are often the mountains, or they are areas where um, uh, they um, can congregate around each other and uh, they can rest assured that uh, neither bandits nor um, uh, evil thinking uh, f fellow villagers would um, uh, would um, uh, deprive them of their possessions or of even of their lives. So uh, the first um, Christians, they survive, but uh, outside the cities that I just mentioned. Why is there this, um, uh, this bloodshed? Well, uh, three things that take place. First of all, you have... Uh, banditry, and uh, this comes along with the collapse of the uh, of the mean state. Um, this is uh, uh, the same in as in uh, in uh, uh, Beijing, for example, but um, uh, you get uh, a, a very clear um, uh, a case of um, uh, of banditry that uh, that drives whole communities apart. Um, the um, uh, the the second uh, a thing that occurs is the conquest itself, and uh, this um, uh, this conquest um, was violent in, in, at times. Um, not not usually or not exclusively because uh, the Ming loyalists uh, resisted, but because they had to deal with the bandits who had established themselves. Zhang uh, Xian. Uh, uh, Zhang Xianzhong is uh, is one of these, and uh, he would of course uh, ha have a very um, big 
uh, importance for uh, for Sichuan. Um, when the Qing soldiers, Qing troops encountered them, uh, th there was there were violent battles, and these battles resulted in uh, uh, whole urban communities dissolving. And the final straw were the um, the the three feudal trees was the three feudal trees uprising, the uh, uh, San Fan Zhuluan, which um, uh, re resulted in a devastating um, uh, with in devastating consequences for for the whole of Sichuan. Uh, the figures are hard to establish, but uh, there is a um, uh, uh, an understanding that um, uh, the situation uh, th that the population um, was probably reduced to about a quarter. Uh, now that weren't really that many. If we if we compare uh, today's figures, I think the is the guaranteed figures are around four million, which is uh, goes to illustrate that such one was still relatively marginal because the. Of course, the core regions of uh, uh, late imperial China had uh, uh, single cities could uh, measure that many. So it's uh, it's not really a uh, an enormous population, but uh, for uh, an agrarian society, it was uh, devastating. So um, uh, if you if you think that uh, a quarter, and some sources even say up to one eighth of the uh, the population were uh, were simply driven away or killed or died of starvation. Um, these were not ideal uh, situations for um, uh, for uh, uh, Christians to establish their uh, their livelihoods. So now we have a um, a situation where the where the next uh, group of um, um, of Christians enter. Namely, um, uh, th these are the same. These are also Jesuits. Uh, um, I've uh, got here Claude Modell um, in uh, and in 1660. Um, they come from neighboring provinces and they bring uh, Christians with them uh, because this is the area when the Qing Empire begins to repopulate Sichuan and uh, it brings with it enormous numbers of, uh, I mean, in relative terms, enormous numbers of migrant populations from all over. And this is why Sichuan Hua is such a, a very distinct, it's actually a, a type of northern dialect, which is pronounced in a very specific way. Um, uh, then the, the definitive, uh, a missionary, Western missionary uh, phase begins in the early 18th century, namely with uh, uh, Luigi Antonio Appiani um, uh, and um, uh, Johannes Müllener when they arrive and they, um, they of course have, uh, uh, they, they bring with them a lot of uh, missionary experience. This is the period when they are fully under the protection of the Kangxi Emperor and uh, they, they, they overcome a local resistance by pulling in uh, uh, the help of uh, uh, commanders, commanders who are Manchus, in fact. Um, Bonijo is one of them. And then we have a Gyoro, I forget his name now, Hu Yasun. Now, th this was the Yongzheng Emperor. I need to check, uh, Hua, maybe Huayin. Uh, yes, Gyoro Huayin. And, and so they come from far away because they are in charge of double provinces uh, in order to establish. Um, the, uh, the the safety of the first uh, convert communities and uh, the, the the Christian communities grow they grow through missionary input the others I mentioned later that's the, uh, the these are the missions étrangères they come yes so uh, this I've already talked about so th that you have a uh, 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 the development of uh, a Christian um, uh, uh, sorry of a religious um, uh, environment which is, um, uh, I'm tempted to use the term syncretic, but it's actually more than that. It's, uh, it, is a, um, uh, it shows that um, popular uh, beliefs, which are, not which are religious, but which are not necessarily theological in the strict, uh, straight sense, um, uh, that they begin to take an interest in uh, in, the Christi in the Catholic Christianity that the missionaries bring along, and they often learn about this second hand. So you get a, a multiplication of Christians who then need to be converted. And we know uh, if you are familiar with the, um, uh, the Jesuit writings, for example, that uh, a, a baptism is a very long process. It's a, it goes along with a, a preparation and then actually a, a questioning, a little bit like being uh, upgraded in a PhD process. So it's a, it's, it takes a lot of preparation for, from the side of the neophyte to actually become a, a, you know, a, 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 a proper Christian.
So the, um, uh, the 19th century is uh, administered in a, a way that we, uh, again, that reflects the marginal status of uh, Sichuan, namely it's, uh, it becomes a, a, a vicariate which includes Tibet, which is very difficult as a missionary area, but not unknown, and Guizhou, Guizhou, which is straight on the uh, ethnic borderline of the, uh, of the Chinese empire. And then later, it becomes almost the uh, exclusive missionary territory of the uh, Mission des étrangères, uh, Missions Étrangères de Paris, uh, which uh, I will say a little bit more about later. Uh, so importantly, and this is uh, where the uh, 18th century is, uh, sorry, the 19th century is extremely, um, uh, uh, is, is, is distinctly separate from other parts of China uh, because uh, after the uh, missionary prohibition of uh, 1724, of the Yongzheng, uh, the beginning of the Yongzheng era, um, the, the Western missionaries were no longer uh, welcomed in China, apart from in Beijing and in Macau. The, the, the everyday running of these uh, Christian communities uh, is uh, being handed over to uh, uh, unordained uh, leaders. Uh, they have the name Jiao uh, Zhang, uh, so they, they are the head of the, uh, the, the Christian communities. And, uh, in the French uh, literature, they're known as chef de chrétienté, so uh, they are Christian uh, uh, Christian leaders, <laughs> Christian um, uh, uh, chiefs, if you like, um, and um, they do absolutely everything that uh, priests would do, although they are aware that they can't carry out um, sacraments. So they there are marriages, absolutely, but they are temporary marriages. They're, they're pending the approval of, of the Vatican. And if you go into the archives, um, the Catholic archives, for example, the, um, the number, the, um, the, the uh, propaganda archives in Rome, then you can see letters where, uh, where official recognition is being, uh, clerical recognition is being sought for de facto um, solutions which the Zhang had arrived at. So for example, André Li, um, yes, um, and, uh, Li Andre and uh, Linus Zhang, uh, uh, Zhang Fang. Uh, th these are figures who uh, are well known to, to uh, the, the Westerners. And how? Because several um, uh, of them are being sent to Europe, to, to Naples, for example, the, uh, the, the uh, school of the uh, Holy Family. Uh, where they uh, undergo a, a proper uh, Christian training, missionary training, uh, where they prepare, where they're being prepared for, for, for the task ahead. Here, once again, to the, um, uh, to the Vocatas Virgines, these Tung uh, uh, Why are they there? B big question. Well, um, uh, one uh, simple explanation is that um, not all of them were really that religious. But uh, the, they had a social function, namely, they kept them safe from marriages they really did not want to um, enter. And uh, for this, uh, of course, um, uh, Robert Entenmann has written on this. Um, uh, uh, and uh, uh, Li Ji, Li Ji also uh, uh, had, um, ha ha has an article. But um, what we know from the, uh, fr from the uh, missionary literature is that um, they uh, were being scrutinized very carefully, and one one of the um, um, one one of the stipulations was that they were uh, of a certain age, and this age was initially set very high. So uh, I think it was thirty five. It was uh, in Chinese terms well past the the marriage, and where, where there was any hope for any marriage. But uh, in the end, th these uh, women became younger and younger because they they found out that they could run away. And in many cases, they actually ran away from arranged marriages in order to be able to meet the, the people they actually were in love with. And um, uh, sometimes with the approval of their parents, their biological parents. So this was, a, uh, uh, this was something that has very little to do with uh, the, the, any Christian function, but um, uh, it was a, um, a, a, a social, it fulfilled a social function, which was, uh, uh, very pronounced in Sichuan. So to summarize, this long uh, 
18th century that goes up to the year when uh, when uh, the missionary presence becomes legal in uh, in Sichuan, 1857. Um, from this is marked by a proliferation of Christianity, which you also see in other parts of uh, of China, but uh, in Sichuan it was particularly pronounced. Why was it particularly pronounced? Because of the last point, um, because uh, Sichuan became a, a missionary based territory. Missionaries, in the sense that they were Chinese missionaries, migrant missionaries went off to other provinces. Secondly, also for European missionaries. And why? Because the Missions Etrangères, who were French uh, missionary organization, uh, managed to enter China, not from the ports, but from the, the mountainous uh, forest covered hinterland uh, through uh, what is nowadays uh, Laos and uh, Burma, so straight through the back door, if you like. And they were present, at least a few of them were present uh, uh, all the time. So th these are the, the ones uh, who I skipped over. Uh, they come in the very beginning of the 18th century, but they leave a trail which, uh, which the other missions étrangères missionaries follow up. Jean Basset, uh, Jean-François de la Balouère, uh, they, uh, they pass on knowledge that, uh, that the um, uh, missions étrangères missionaries uh, take along. Here's a map. If, uh, if you, uh, it's a you, newly completed map, so if you want to have local knowledge uh, based on uh, defunct children, um, then uh, try to find out uh, teammaps.org, it's non-profit making, run by the Manchu Foundation in Leiden, um, and uh, it's uh, Leiden and Australia somewhere. So it's, um, so it's a very interesting one. So you can find all the places that I uh, uh, refer to and also where the churches are. I promise to be fast. I know that time is running away. Um, so this is um, th this is again what, what I talked about earlier on, uh, namely that um, because of the um, uh, big um, upsets of the uh, in, in political terms, uh, which had caused um, the almost the the end of the Qing Dynasty, the premature end of the Qing Dynasty, Sichuan was suffering particularly hard. And because of the deprivations, because of the bloodshed, it, it relied on a constant stream of migrants. Sichuan is the, uh, the only large scale um, magnet for migration um, that you find in uh, late Qing China. So it's, uh, it remains a, uh, a, an engine for uh, at least seasonal migration, so agrarian migration, right until the 20th century. Um, whereas in the eastern parts, and uh, sorry, in the rest of China, it was the eastern parts of of, uh, of the Qing territory, especially the Jiangnan um, or <coughs> south uh, southeastern China, which had this role. So, what about the title of my talk? Well, small town life. What what, what is it about this small town life? Well, um, because of the uh, early upsets, many of the Christians who were converted in the big cities, they did the logical thing. They escaped the fighting by going into small locations outside, uh, outside the um, uh, cities such as uh, Chengdu. And this is the reason why you find uh, so many churches dotted around the larger cities. Baxian is, is a good example, that uh, which I'm going to mention later. And um, so uh, they uh, wanted to live normal lives. So they, they, it was not the case of setting up alternative uh, heretical centers outside the, the, the big cities, uh, but uh, they, they did um, uh, very much uh, do their best in order to blend into the environments. And this is what the missionary sources say. This is also what I found out when I did my own research, namely that when they were discovered by mistake almost, usually when, uh, uh, when uh, Qing troops were looking out for uh, people belonging to the um, uh, Balian, uh, Balian Jiao, the, the White Lotus, so popular Buddhist religions. Uh, it meant that they were actually, uh, they, they were stumbling across Christian communities. 
So they have blended in so well that it was uh, uh, quite, uh, uh, it, uh, it was, they were almost disbelieving uh, uh, the officials that they were, uh, that they could be anything else but uh, heretics. And um, uh, the, 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 their Christian identity without any evidence of uh, missionaries, Western missionaries in any case, um, uh, took the, um, uh, the, the empire itself by, uh, by, by surprise. I mean, this is something that is, is very clear from the, uh, the, the sources that you find in the number one archives, the former imperial um, uh, archives. Also, um, you have the uh, funerals, which are very clearly different from the uh, Buddhist funerals because of the early uh, ex uh, existence of, uh, of, of, of Christian, of very clear Christian messages. And this, of course, um, it makes you think of the, um, uh, the, the rights controversy. Well, like, uh, turn on the living room lights. Yes. Well, it makes you think of the, uh, the rights controversy, but the rights controversy is very much uh, something that is far away from Sichuan. It later, of course, makes a, um, uh, it reappears, uh, but um, uh, in a very different way. That's, I don't want to talk about this now. Uh, also, marriages, um, very clearly a family, um, a, 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 an internal family, uh, a, a promotion of Christianity by forming allegiances, including marriages with other Christian families. So in other words, the Christians multiply, not so much through um, missionary action, be it Chinese or Western, but they do it very much like the Muslims in China. They simply multiply biologically by forming families and increasing in number. So, yes. And then, uh, and here at the very end, church elders, so these are the Jiaozhang, who I mentioned uh, earlier on. So they formed a very clear, and this is uh, clear from the sources that you find, uh, they form a very clear, um, they have a very um, unique, uh, they play a very unique feature in uh, in the lives of the um, uh, this, uh, th these little towns, these villages that uh, th that the Christians dominate. An image. This is a house or a church. Well, um, has a cross on top, but you you have to imagine that for most of the time uh, uh, in uh, the Qing era, they had no cross on top, and they would not have had. Uh, these, uh, the, the, it would not have said Tian uh, Tang, uh, it would not have had any Christian inscriptions on it. Uh, the, the fact is that from the sources that I could find for the largest uh, time, uh, the, 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 and how do we know this? This is when the, uh, uh, this is when Qing officials, uh, Qing troops arrive and they find no indication of their, their Christian identity apart from religious objects inside, inside, not outside. And the Westerners who very clearly are perplexed by the absence of church, uh, of, of uh, church facades and church architecture, although there are churches everywhere. In other words, the 18th and 19th century are dominated by house churches. House churches are of course, what um, we nowadays um, know are, you know, extra legal, um, types of congregations, in actual fact, they were common. They were, that was the most common form of, uh, of Christianity that you find in the uh, 19th century. So we, we get figures, uh, for, for example, by the, uh, uh, the, 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 the uh, yes, by Dufres, who has a, um, the apostolic vicar, Dufres, who has, uh, who has very um, detailed figures about the Christians who he can count. And so he comes to 53 uh, congregations in Sichuan. Uh, this is probably correct, but the numbers are uh, probably higher. So this is 1806. This is after uh, almost 80 years of, um, uh, of, um, uh, of, of the more than 80 years of, of Christian, of uh, prohibition of proselytization. So how do we get this constantly in increasing number through word of mouth? This is self-propagation and of course, also through intermarriage. This leads to the effect that, that, that uh, entire villages and sometimes large sections of small towns become Christian. Um, the, um, these underground churches are, uh, that's uh, very clear from the uh, archives in Baxian, um, they, um, 
uh, they are so much so uh, a feature of life that uh, actually it becomes um, a, um, uh, the, the Sichuanese take it as a, as a badge of honor uh, not to apostatize. Apo apostatism in other sources that I found, and this might be, uh, this, I, I accept that um, uh, th there, there may be uh, uh, many examples that speak against that, but in general, in China, um, uh, it is, uh, Christians take a very um, flexible attitude when they're being forced by local uh, magistrates to apostatize. Um, formal uh, uh, for, formal um, uh, relinquish, um, to formally relinquish Christianity, but then later to, uh, to rejoin the church was the norm in most parts of China where I found uh, evidence for that. In Sichuan, you hear that uh, many are prepared to become martyred, which is a, um, of course, in actual fact, they, the, the, the team uh, prefer to uh, send these people into exile, but um, they, um, it is um, something which shows that the, uh, the uh, quality of the church in Sichuan is quite different. And this, uh, this fact, of course, is um, um, uh, one of the reasons why the um, Catholic Church was so confident that um, uh, it could continue to exist in the features that I just described, that in the year 1803, you get the Sichuan Synod. Synod means that you actually have a, a, a formal gathering of all the uh, congregations, of all the uh, uh, Jiao Zhang and all the, the priests, usually foreign priests, uh, who discuss um, issues on uh, everyday life, such as baptism, marriages, also death, in uh, communities which simply have no priests, so the sacraments ca cannot be uh, carried out. The fact that you have a synod at the time when, in theory, the, uh, the proselytization of Christianity is illegal is uh, astounding. But um, this also goes to show that uh, Christianity, Catholic Christianity, was uh, so firmly implanted that uh, no temporary uh, political action could actually reverse this. Um, and this is where the, you get the, uh, the term of the uh, chrétien thé, which, uh, which becomes a feature, a uh, stock feature of the, um, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the evidence that you find in the archives of the Mission Etrangère, uh, which um, indicates that you have um, communities that are like, they are just like um, uh, Western um, uh, congregations, but uh, they lack priests. The, this, is the, this is the main meaning of this term. Um, so you have uh, in these chrétien day from, from the beginning of the 19th century onwards, you get the increasing presence of Western missionaries, and the majority of them are French. They, uh, they come through this corridor that I described, uh, and uh, this is before it is legal for any Westerner to settle within the, or to even visit the, uh, the interior of, the, uh, uh, of China, of the Qing Empire. Uh, before 1858, you also get the first attempts, but these are, these are not actually um, uh, serious attempts. They are, um, because the, the Protestants are very much uh, in awe of the, uh, uh, the Christian communities that they find in uh, the interior of China, such as Sichuan, they refer to them as the old Christian, Christian areas, the old Christianities, the old, uh, uh, they, they refer to them as the old Christians as if they were non-Christians. So they set out to convert old Christians. What you get is a, a genuine struggle between the Catholic and the Protestant communities. It's, it's an interesting feature. Uh, it's mostly a very peaceful one, but it's uh, something that needs to be noted because at that time, the spirit of the Ecumen was, uh, was not present. So you have a very clear uh, rivalry between the two. And then uh, finally you get, uh, this is what I uh, am now going to end the presentation with, you get a, um, a presence of ethnic minorities. These ethnic minorities, um, they uh, uh, develop a specific interest in, um, 
they develop a specific interest in the um, uh, in the um, uh, Catholic, but also other Christian um, uh, uh, beliefs and congregations. Um, uh, and that's where the, the Protestants, of course, very much uh, uh, interested in. Uh, here you see a, a Tiang church, which happens to be Catholic, but th this e church is Protestant. And then uh, as one of my PhD students is uh, currently uh, uh, experiencing right now in her field work, she, uh, um, also slightly beyond the boundaries of uh, uh, of um, uh, Sichuan, namely here in uh, Shimenkan, which is in Guizhou, um, you find um, uh, you find that uh, the uh, non Han Chinese uh, uh, communities take a great interest in Christianity, um, and in this case, actually in Protestant Christianity. So it's a uh, uh, Samuel Pollard is, of course, the one who invents a an alphabet for the uh, script for, for the uh, for the Hmong for the Miao uh, in uh, in Shumankan. But um, the same can be said for missionaries in other places. So they have a very important role um, for for the development of a, um, a separate separate and very clearly defined uh, ethnic identity. So um, here, just um, to since we're talking about everyday life, 19th century opium, opium, smoking of opium, what does the church say against uh, for, for, about this? Well, the church for, formulated very clear uh, guidelines, namely that opium smoking was not on for any of the um, uh, uh, for, for, for any of the members of the congregation when it was time for mass, when it was fasting time. So they had very clear um, boundaries when. Uh, opium could not be smoked. In fact, tobacco could not be smoked. In fact, alcohol could not be drunk. So it's on the same level as um, uh, as these other two drugs that I just mentioned. Um, uh, are they um, involved in the um, prohibition of opium? Yes, but much later, much later. Uh, but this is also something they share with the Protestant missionaries. So it's uh, um, we should not con confuse um, uh, the smoking of opium after work with uh, the heavy addiction that we see in the early 20th century, for example, uh, of drugs such as heroin and morphine. Last two, two or three slides, it's uh, just examples from the uh, Bashian archives that I came across. Um, so um, it's, it's, what, what, was the, um, what was the role of, uh, of the ch uh, Christian communities in everyday life? Towards the end of the teen era, they were fully integrated. And what you find is that um, uh, the, the state cooperates completely. So here we have an example of a church in Chengdu where, uh, where things were being stolen. So they go to the police and it's being treated just like a, a, a very ordinary um, a case of theft. If you go along this, um, the, the same uh, 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 list, you find some interesting features, but it's, it's very detailed. So you have uh, um, liturgical, uh, instruments that you that you find being uh, being used in the uh, uh, I I inside the churches, so you know precisely what what was being uh, uh, what the um, mi missionaries used. Uh, sorry, what the ch churches um, used. Okay, so um, how does it all end in the nineteenth century? So I'm going to um, uh, end with this. Um, uh, well, uh, Sichuan had large converted uh, large areas of converts with converts. But um, the, um, uh, they lived very peacefully with the local populations. That was, it was very rare for, for there to be any uh, conflict. Of course, there are exceptions. So for example, uh, 86, we get a, a, a bout of violence, which is usually related to, um, to, to conflicts about uh, soil, about um, uh, agrarian territory. And in those, um, on those occasions, um, you do get violence, and this violence uh, can result in bloodshed. It can also result in uh, burnt down churches. Um, so, for example, the, the church that you see at the bottom was, uh, was burnt in that case uh, in the um, uh, in the Boxer uprising, uh, um That's the Su Jiawan Church, which uh, goes up in flames and is reconstructed in later earlier years. You have the uh, uh, the Da Zhu Church in Chongqing, uh, which uh, is being burnt down together with the clinic and a, I think there was a school as well. So, um, but these are relatively rare cases. How does the official Chinese historiography, uh, so after 1949, treat that? Of course, it's resistance against 
foreign imperialism. But what I hope that you have learned in this session is that um, it is actually a case of complete indigenization that you see in Sichuan. Uh, the, the Catholic communities in Sichuan, they are actually three self before three self was invented. They are self funded. The Western missionaries contribute nothing. They have uh, Mission d'Etrangère. They have uh, they they arrive with a, a bag full of uh, medicine, maybe if if they are lucky. But there is no uh, stream of money that comes from outside. They are funded by the um, by the communities, namely mostly by trading families, silk weavers. They are very um, active in in Sichuan. Uh, shop owners. So you have um, this is uh, what small town life is like. It's self-funding. It's self-propagating. So you have a um, you have a, a church that multiplies without any uh, uh, without any uh, foreign uh, input um, until 1858, and then you've got the um, uh, the uh, the end of the prohibition, and all of a sudden you have the Western missionaries who go out and who uh, build these magnificent churches that I saw earlier on, but several of them, of course, older. They were built despite um, uh, the, the uh, theoretical um, uh, prohibition against missionary activity. And they are, although they are part of the Catholic Church, they're actually also, um, their, their structures are self-provided. So this is nothing that is actually a, uh, um, uh, funded from the exterior. So I'm going to leave this last slide open while I, um, uh, welcome you, uh, your questions. And um, so these are my sources, the sources that I'm using, um, the uh, archival sources, and then also uh, some of the authors, uh, Gourdon, uh, Lonet, Dernier, Fang Hao, uh, they are very good uh, providers of details on Christianity in uh, Sichuan. So thank you very much for the time being. Thank you, Lars, for a fantastic and very, very rich presentation um, on the complex uh, question of uh, Christianity, specifically Catholicism in Sichuan. And, and I think it, uh, it fits extremely well, your project, into our larger project that, that of course, de uh, also deals with the complex religious landscape uh, influenced by, by migration, by ethnic diversity, by lack of strong political control, by the position, physical, geographical position of Sichuan. So um, in that context, I wanted to just post on uh, our chat, uh, the, the page, the webpage, which I didn't uh, post at the beginning for our Sichuan religions project, which, uh, of which uh, you are part and parcel. So uh, with that being said, I just want to, uh, um, encourage anyone to ask questions. You can either just unmute yourself and ask a question or uh, put your hand up like Simon Forbes just did. So please, Simon, um, go ahead. Uh, thanks. Thanks for the work, work around my, the um, technical problems and get in here in the end. Anyway, um, excellent lecture as usual, Lars. Um, just asking, um, I think you mentioned that communion couldn't be administered. Uh, because there were no priests. I mean, well, another problem would have been confirmation, because a confirmation not only requires a priest, it requires a bishop. I was just wondering, where were the nearest sort of um, authority figures, bishop? We were discussing this, this, this issue, the mountains are higher, the emperor is far away, but presumably also bishops, and uh, certainly the pope would be even further away, perhaps. But where, uh, where were the sort of authority figures in cardinal? Were there any in India or, or um, Indochina? But, so. Where, where were the nearest bishops and um, archbishops and authority figures? Uh, yes, uh, so uh, yes, there, this is a very clear uh, answer. So let me just put you um, back into the slide with the sources. Then I'm going to uh, I, I actually, I, I can almost answer it by uh, uh, archive by archive. So the um, the the, the normal answer to this question would come from the propaganda archives. Why? Because um, a copy of the, uh, the letters that the uh, um, missionaries, the Western missionaries, sent to, um, uh, sent to Europe, to, the, um, to, to their own missionary congregations, a copy of that also goes to the, the central archive, namely in, in Rome. Um, and there, how, do they, how do they become aware of this? when they meet these 
heads of the church, these uh, and how do they get in touch with them uh, when they crisscross either through the, the back route that I described before. So they, if they're part of the uh, Mission Saint-Angère, they come up from, from the, um, the, the hinter, Southeast Asian hinterland or um, uh, through Macau. Aumann, Macau is the, uh, is the official uh, place where, sorry, is the place where uh, Catholics can officially congregate in the eyes of the, uh, the, the Chinese state. And they can also officially stay in Beijing. So in order to get from one place to the next, you have to cross China somehow. And Sichuan was on the route for many of these uh, travelers. This was an indirect route and was sometimes quite dangerous, but um, it was often taken. So, it's, uh, uh, so they pick up information en route. If they are ordained priests, then they can carry out these um, uh, marriages and that th you would find examples in the literature, in the missionary uh, letters, um, where they state how many baptisms, how many marriages, how, yes, how many communities as well were being carried out. What you get is a very weird type of Catholicism, namely uh, something that is administered by non-ordained priests, almost as if they were Protestants. So in other words, you get a reduced number of, uh, of um, uh, sacraments, and even the sacraments are being carried out as if they were symbolical. So um, like a Methodist Eucharist, which is completely symbolical, um, no, no transformation of the, the, the host into, into flesh and the uh, wine into, um, uh, into, um, into blood. Uh, so it's uh, not uh, transubstantiation, it's not co-substantiation, it's just purely symbolical. And, and this is something that from a theological viewpoint I find uh, fascinating because uh, the Sichuanese Christians, the Catholics, they're essentially inventing their own form of Protestantism. So, um, uh, yes, and this you find, uh, of course, not in the, <laughs> in the Catholic archives, because uh, <clears throat> they pro probably have got a heart attack if they had heard that, but, they, uh, but you find it quite clearly in the, um, uh, in the uh, number one archives, uh, uh, they, they, where they describe the, um, the, the rituals and the... Um, uh, and also the paraphernalia that the um, uh, Christians, uh, the officials uh, uh, recognize when inside the um, uh, homes. So this is a, a, a very, um, um, well, um, a, a minimal, uh, a, a type of Catholic Christianity that exists with a minimum of, uh, of, the, of the normal requirements. Yeah. But presumably this is because it's a kind of second best type communion. Right, second best, not, yes. Not definitely. because they don't believe substantiation no. doesn't exist when you have a priest. It's just because the priest is not available, so you have to make do. That's right. And they, of course, they have migrant uh, uh, preachers who are, um, who sometimes have been ordained, but that comes late. That comes uh, in the... Uh, Mm. very late 19th century. Thanks, Lars. Um, are there other questions? Um, anyone who would like to... Uh, <clears throat> uh, so there's, there's a question in the chat, um, which I, I assume means that this person cannot uh, unmute themselves. So I will read it to you, Lars, but you can I'll read it for everybody. Could you please elaborate on the difference between texts translated by missionaries in Sichuan and those produced by missionaries in other provinces in quantity, in genre, and in national influence. Mm -hmm. um, so um, in a general, very broad, um, uh, in very broad lines, there were many fewer texts that were available um, um, compared to the areas around Beijing, especially so in the Jing uh, it's called the, the so the, basically the uh, in Zhili and Henan uh, the, 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 in the area around Beijing, the Jing in uh, uh, in Zhili, um, which is the province that goes around it, and, and then also in a uh, almost a vertical line down towards Guangzhou, you get a, a steady flow of literature. Um, how, how do you get this? Because there are uh, illegal, strictly speaking, uh, print shops in, in Beijing that produce this literature. Um, and they 
travel with people along the trade routes to towards Guangzhou. It's as simple as that. Sometimes to uh, to, um, uh, to to, to um, uh, Macau, but uh, Sichuan was out of the way, and uh, for this reason, it's it's much more difficult to uh, transport uh, literature, and also the type of uh, literature that would have been needed. Uh, so we're talking about the pre eighteen fifty eight uh, years when it was not. Uh, Possible for Westerners to, to, to travel um, would have been, um, uh, you know, very uh, simple prayer books or uh, you know pamphlets. Um, those did find their way into uh, into Sichuan. So th these are quite similar. But the the more complex the uh, the tr translations of parts of the Bible, for example, uh, you don't find them uh, in genre. Well, it, they are, you know, they are sections of the uh, uh, of the sacred scriptures those you get you get also um for the later 19th century i've seen uh, uh what you could describe as psalm books so for for uh, uh singing in latin and this is uh, transliterated latin it's quite interesting so you get um um, um ca chinese characters that are read in a certain way and there <clears throat> i remember that um this goes back a long time. I have no pictures of them, but I, I, I took very, a very clear mental record. If I can find them anywhere, then I will uh, pay a lot of money for that. Um, these are uh, books that were printed in the early 19th century, early, no, where are we? 20th century, early 20th century. So, uh, but they go back to, to earlier imprints, uh, local ones. Um, uh, and the pronunciation of the characters was quite uh, similar to... Uh, uh, to, to today's pronunciation, so uh, ya of course is an a, ah, so it's so uh, so. Uh, but uh, uh, so this is the kind of uh, uh, liturgical literature that you would get, a genre quantity so less national influence. They were not as influential because the uh, m many of the uh, uh, the, the um, uh, Christians were um, lived in the countryside. They lived in small places where. Uh, complete literacy was not demanded. So it's a clear difference to places such as Shanghai, for example, Xujiahui and so on. Great, thank you. I uh, <clears throat> like to invite uh, anyone else to uh, uh, ask a question. Okay, so Noriko Sato, please go ahead. Yes, thank you very much, Ross. It's a very interesting presentation. I'm sorry, I cannot turn on camera at the moment. And my question is about the proliferation of the Christian population in Sichuan during the uh, Qing period. So it's, as far as I understand, it's not because on, it's not just because of the proliferation uh, through marriage, but also there are some other factors, I suppose, and how the local Christian population become really big in the 18th, 19th century. Okay. Uh Yes, it's uh, it's a very interesting question, and it's uh, one which uh, becomes obvious when you look at the um, uh, the the type of people who um, uh, act as preachers. And so, it's not completely true that they are self propagating in terms of uh, uh, you know just normal biological. <laughs> um, extension of their families and so on, uh, there is a lot of preaching going on and. Um, uh, this is done by itinerant preachers. Uh, they also exist in other provinces. So I, I have examples from Shanxi and from uh, Hunan, but, um, but in Sichuan, this is particularly pronounced. Why? Because they have a lot of uh, seasonal workers who come in for, for, during the agrarian, uh, the, 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 for, the agri for the harvesting cycle. And um, uh, these, amongst these, um, uh, seasonal workers, uh, you, you get you get many people who become Christians in Sichuan and then who go back into their their provinces or into another part of Sichuan. So it's uh, uh, so there is really a transmission of uh, uh, Christ the Christian message through preaching and through conversions on the spot. Um, who converts to Christianity? Often it's people who converted before to uh, to uh, popular Buddhist uh, uh, beliefs. Uh, again, this is very similar to um, uh, what you can find in other parts of, of China, but, uh, but, but in Sichuan it's pronounced because you have this 
uh, high flow of, uh, of a transient population, you could say. Thank you, it's very interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. Do we have any other questions? <clears throat> Comments? Andrea Yanku, go ahead. Yes, please. Yeah, sorry. Um, just, just very quickly, maybe Lars, I was interested in what you said about um, becoming Christian or being Christian as a way to avoid an arranged marriage um, and wondered what kinds of sources you can rely on for that, because I imagine that's not easy to find out what, what the motivations are, or if they were yeah. kind of Christians first and because of that, or, be, or if they became Christians in order to, I mean, this, what, 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 are the, what is the evidence for that? I'd be very, very curious. Thank yes, you. Yes, you have some. You have some reports. I mean, this is a phenomenon of the uh, of the twentieth um, turn of the twentieth century, late nineteenth century. So, um, it, the uh, in the beginning, you have um, uh, it is really a um, a place where where people where women uh, resort to if they have other reasons, like um, if they it's very almost as if they wanted to. Um, uh, follow a religious calling, but they were not um, Buddhists, for example. Um, and and this is one of the stipulations of the um, uh, th that that um, is being set out by um, uh, by um, uh, Matilia that they, he has to be certain that these women are actually Christians, <laughs> so that they uh, that they are not Buddhists and they try to bring Buddhist um, rituals into the monasteries. But that's in the 18th century. In the 19th century, we have. Uh, we have uh, evidence, um, and um, th this we get in the MEP archives. We get in the uh, we get um, uh, uh, evidence in uh, from Paris, uh, where uh, the uh, where women are being pointed out who uh, are there for clearly non-religious purposes, and um, uh, I can I can see whether I can identify them. Uh, uh, the um, the only printed examples of these, I think they are in, uh, in an Entenmann publication. Um, I, I, have to, I have to look out for it, but in any case, it's, uh, it's from the MEP archives in, in, in Paris that, you, that, that I got this. Thank you. Thank you. Nice that you participated. <laughs> yes. I'm sorry. We have three more questions, and the first one is from Fu Yingbai. Hi, Lars. Hi. Um, apologies that I'm naturally interested in the visual materials that you present and also the stylistic um, styles of architecture. I think it's really interesting that you mentioned the, uh, all those churches. Um, they look pretty um, Chinese style from the outside, and the kind of try to blend in, but inside is more uh, European or let's say Catholic. So I wonder if you see any differences um, on the one hand between big cities and those uh, small um, towns and local areas, and also as um, prior or after the like 1858, okay, they probably don't build that uh, that quickly. So let's say after 1860s, because I know very little about those, but from what I remember seeing, like say big cities like Beijing, um, those big churches never tend to try to blend in. Well, of course they, they probably can't. And uh, also thinking of in terms of timing, let's say after 1860s, when more European um, missionaries come in, priests, so do they naturally um, prefer maybe a, a more European style? And also probably there's, again, no reason to hide anymore and, or that determination to try to blend in. So mm -hmm. I wonder if you actually see that and what do you think that um, differences are mm -hmm. uh, or the, the reasons behind the differences? Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, for that, I, th that's actually something that you can also see in other provinces, especially in Guangdong, um, that, um, that once you have Western missionaries established, that uh, European architecture follows. Um, uh, but uh, not always. I mean, the, the churches that you saw, they, go, they, they, they were built during the, um, the period of missionary prohibition. 
um, which is quite amazing, but it just shows you that the prohibition was not really uh, effective. Um, but uh, in, for most most of the time, it really depended whether you were getting on with the um, with the uh, the tricien, uh, whether the uh, magistrate wanted to give you trouble or what, whether you got along well with them. Um, but but once a church had been built. Then who went? Who went there? Well, uh, of course, it was the uh, the local um, the local community, and uh, those were usually people who felt safe. Why did they feel safe? Because they were in the countryside. They were really far away from the city. Um, in the cities themselves, before 1858, you get no churches at all. I mean, you get no no. Um, no. You get no Western churches uh, uh, at all. You get you only get house churches. And, and this is for, uh, uh, in the Basian archives, very, very uh, clear. It's uh, uh, when they get, um, you know, European visitors who remark, or uh, in, in one case, it was a police officer <laughs> in the Yemen. They, they were interrogating a, a, a Westerner with a name that looked French to me in transliteration. And, uh, um, uh, and they also said, yes, he was looking out for churches, but couldn't find any. And then, um, and then he was being told, no. <laughs> You know, don't be stupid. They, they're everywhere. So it's um, uh, th this is the absence of um, a very grandiose um, uh, uh, architectural schemes in cities up to 1858 into the 1860s, and then then it's the reverse. Namely, in the countryside, you continue to have um, uh, this blended type of architecture, and in the cities, the Westerners build very European style churches. So that becomes a feature of the 20th century, for example. Thanks. I think um, I also heard um, from other um, uh, talks about uh, Islam, uh, like little Islam and Islamic style of um, religious uh, buildings. I think it's really similar to see like a lot of those from our side, they all look really Chinese and all those Islamic type of um, calligraphy, they don't show un until you actually get into the courtyard. So yeah, I think that's really interesting. Thank well, you. that goes back to the Ming era, because of course, when you have the end of the the Mongols, the the Yuan, um, there are actually edicts which are which prohibit the the, the building of minarets and um, um, and uh, which say that the church, the, the the mosque has to be set aside, has to be built set aside from the street, the main road. Um, in China, it's of course the same, but they they can't, <laughs> they don't even advertise the fact that it's a church. <laughs> um, th th this, is th this is the difference, uh, because the, the Muslims are better established. They've they, been around for many hundred years at that point. Uh, in Sichuan, I mean, we're talking about Sichuan now specifically. It's only from the 17th century onwards, that, um, and especially from the early 18th century onwards, that, that, that they are there. So they're relatively new. Um, and, um, and they don't want to provoke any uh, um, any any objections by their neighbors and they don't want to have any um uh, they don't want to have any uh, uh nosy uh, Qing officials who come and to find out wh what their connections are with uh, bypassing strangers for example hmm? yes but it's true yes thank you Mani right. yeah. uh so there were two uh hands raised now there's only one uh if uh, that second person wants to raise their hand again, that's totally fine, but uh, we're going to go with Aixin Yi. Uh, thank you, Professor Loma, for the, giving this interesting, very, very interesting topic. And I really like focusing on the living normally and of this uh, underground creations. Uh, so I have like two, just two small questions. One is that you mentioned that uh, Sichuan creation once become, um, became a act active missionaries when they migrate uh, into Southwestern province, uh, provinces. But I wonder how they can like act very actively as mi missionaries. Is that this part is not like the state didn't have much control on this this uh, provinces, um, they're less prohibition, so they can they can preach more freely, right? It had no control. <laughs> this was clearly outside the 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 area where the Qing uh, officials had any access to, and the same during the Republican era. This was completely uh, uncharted territory. 
Um, so yeah. you you had um, you had the 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 the, full, the, um, the capital uh, of the um, the district. Beyond that, uh, especially if it was ethnic minority areas, the very rarely you had uh, you had any uh, presence. What you got, <laughs> what you, so so this is a uh, an uh, area which uh, where, where you get the. Uh, uh, the type of politics, inter-ethnic politics, which is uh, not not so uh, often reported now, um, uh, it's not the that the, the the ethnic minorities were wary of the Han Chinese. That you also get, but it's often that um, there was tension in between ethnic groups. So, um, for example, between the Yi and the Miao. Uh, so it's the, um, the this was a very tense relationship. And you you find what um, you also get in other areas which are mostly Han, but where you have subdivisions such as the Kejaran, uh, you know Hakka in, and but but that's not in Sichuan. This is in, in Guang, uh, Guangdong and in uh, Fujian. Um, that uh, whole communities convert in order to get the protection of the missionaries, and uh, so if they are uh, under threat from a neighboring village, for example. Uh, let's take the, I mean, Sri Khan, it was qu quite clear, the, uh, the, the Miao um, of Sri Khan, they were directly threatened by, um, they were always, <laughs> they always drew the shorter straw when it came to a competition with the, with the Yi, and once the uh, mission had established itself there, they, they were more or less protected, they became uh, autonomous, and they, uh, and on the other side, on the Yi side, you had different missionary orders, they, so they were no longer in direct uh, conflict with each other. So uh, this is one reason why you have uh, conversion in these minority areas. Um, uh, but, but yes, it's, it's, it's very clear that um, uh, they were also converting because they could, because um, there was not so much uh, interference by, from, the, from the, not just the central government even, and not the provincial government, but even from the 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 the, the Xian, you know, Xian level, um, they would never have sent that the the the, the, the Yaman, Yaman troops there. It was uh, simply too risky. Um, uh, not even because of uh, you know bandits or so, but because of nature. It's it's a very uh, these are often in the mountains. Um, the weather is uh, often unpredictable. Um, animals, wild animals, so it's everything that the uh, poisonous snakes, anything that uh, you could avoid in order to get into these areas. So if you had Christians there, and this is actually a fact that you also find in uh, countries such as uh, Burma. So if you go into the no north, you find that many of the ethnic minorities, the um, Karen, for example, that they uh, converge on block to, uh, to Christianity, uh, quite simply because it protects them from, uh, from neighboring uh, tribes or uh, populations, uh, but also from occasional contact with government soldiers. Uh, okay, thank you. But I also wonder, as you mentioned that um, the Western missionary, they, they like uh, established this autonomous uh, uh, control, but, but is the, the you know, this, any native Sichuan Christians also became the missionaries? Oh, yes, 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 yes. But how's but, the, uh, sorry, but how's the, like the Han, Han, uh, Han native Sichuan Christians, do they have like also a uh, tension with the ethnic minorities? It, not so much in Sichuan. Sichuan is uh, uh, fair, by that time, is fairly much in control of the, uh, the, the Han majority already. In the West, you get into the um, uh, the Tibetan area, so Xiang and so on and so on. and the uh, so it's a um, th there you get a different religious culture as well. So um, they would try to um, avoid direct conflict uh, with them. That that's the uh, so uh, Han Chinese um, preachers would go into Han villages, for example. So they would not they would not go into minority areas. It's the Westerners. Who go into minority areas. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, this is fascinating. So we have one more question, uh, Yi Tong Chiu. Uh, thank you so much, Lars, for your presentation. So I have a, a question regarding the state categorization of Zhenjiao and Xiejiao. 
Do you find any evidence regarding how did the state categorize these churches? And did the state change their attitude over time in Qin? Yes. Um, somebody wrote a thesis about this. <laughs> it's the, uh, I will give it to you the next time. It's the, um, so the, um, th there's the year 1724, which is the, uh, the second year of the, the Yongzhong reign. Uh, what happens then is, is not so much a prohibition of Christianity because this is usually how it's uh, interpreted. Um, it's wrong. It's, um, it's uh, a, a prohibition of Christian proselytization. And it's also the beginning of a, um, a, a very strict attitude towards any kind of religious proselytization in China in general. So if you're, um, if you're a Buddhist, uh, you, have to, you have to prove that, you're, uh, that you belong to one of the authorized uh, Buddhist, um, what would you call them, the, uh, sects or teachings. And then um, if, you, if you did, uh, then you could go around and, and, and beg, for example, but you needed to have a, a number. You know, that, that's the time when uh, the uh, Qing government issues uh, identity numbers for, for, for begging uh, Buddhist monks, for example. Um, and um, so who is Xie, who is Zheng? That's um, a, a very good question. It's, uh, in essence, it's um, uh, if, there is a, if there's unrest, then the... Um, uh, the officials would usually assume that anyone who belongs to a uh, religious group that is not easily put into a category, um, that they regard them as xie. And then you have to prove uh, that you are not xie. Uh, where do you find evidence for this? You find it in, uh, in police records where you have, uh, well, I, I used a lot of them in the Yilish Danganguan. Uh, Susan Aka used them as well, but for different purposes. And um, they're very, they are very interesting in terms of, they can be, you can use them for teaching Chinese. Why? Because the, the, the official side is, the, the official part is all very set, it's Qing terminology and, and very standard form. It's almost like a, a form that you, it is printed, but it's not printed, it's handwritten. And then, and then you have the insert where you get the, um, the, the statement of the, um, uh, the, the, uh, the person who's been arrested. Uh, and that's all in Baihua. It's all in, uh, this is almost uh, like modern Chinese. It's, and, and often they don't know the characters. The, the, the scribes don't know well, uh, how to render a character. So you get the codes of Pang and then you get uh, the, the ca character that, is, uh, that they think it is, um, for, especially when it comes to names and places and so on. Um, and, um, and what it shows very clearly is that the um, people who were arrested, they always tried to, um, uh, to justify their, uh, their membership of a certain group by virtue that it was um, of, of having followed the, the calling of their parents, the tradition of their parents. So they were, they were actually very xiao, they were very filial. And because of this, they were actually being very good. And, and you get this oft, often in the uh, statement, in the legal statement, if you follow this up and then you go to the end and then it says, uh, the judge said, oh, uh, forget about it. It's like they, they were all doing, uh, they all believed they were doing something good and they, they were just continuing the teaching of their, 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 their parents and their ancestors. And uh, we, they, we told them not to do anything silly and uh, go home. Um, in cases when it was, um, um, banner officials, you know, with Mr. Uh, Chiren, they, it was very strict in theory, you know, they could uh, be erased from the, uh, the, the, the registers, they could be sent into exile, and that often happened. Um, but uh, the fact that even at the very end of the Qing era, you come across um, uh, people who had been Christians for many generations, going back to the, you know, Kangxi era, um, that shows that um, you, you could be, um, you could follow a, a prohibited religion without anyone noticing or without anyone uh, protesting. So that, 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 that is something that I found very interesting. And that's also for the first time where I developed an interest for, for, for Manchu sources. Um, yes, it was, um, I, yes. Um, I, I would have looked. Would I had I written my thesis now? I would have looked at uh, Manchu Christianity completely, completely differently, of course. 
Uh, but um, uh, so I just took it through the Chinese route, through the Yilish and Angaguan Chinese language uh, materials. But uh, um, of course, nowadays I would uh, take a completely different uh, angle. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wonderful. Are there any other questions, <clears throat> comments from the audience? I actually have one question. I've obviously fascinated by this um, indigenization that you talk about, and uh, and I, you know, there would be many questions that I have about that. But one specific, more specific question about another dichotomy uh, that came up to my mind is that between lay and clerical, because you mentioned that these uh, so-called priests were from you know, local religious leaders that uh, were not clerics or had not been ordained. Um, and, and at this time in other religions, in other traditions, we do see uh, a flourishing of lay uh, altars, or we call them lay altars in, you know, in popular religions also, Apparently in Islam, there was a, a real <clears throat> a flourishing of, um, of lay community leaders who donated and fundraised for, um, for their own communities, religious communities. So I wonder if these, if there is any um, sense that these uh, people that you talk about, that especially between 1724 and 1857, that took up, uh, you know, uh, the... Uh, 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 the leadership in these communities, if there was any self-identifying um, as lay or clerics or, or identifying by other people as lay or clerical. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, so what is it that gives them authority and how are they selected? Uh, they're often um, catechists, so catechists, so they are uh, people who are familiar with Christianity. So it's not as if they were... Uh, community leaders who then also take on a religious role. It's the other way around. So at least, at least according to the, the Western Christian documents that I found. So it's um, always, they always stress that they were uh, good Christians and that they actually had a, a, uh, an ability to, to preach and to uh, adjudicate on, a, uh, on religious matters, on, on matters of um, propriety or, or matters of uh, uh, re, uh, Christian morality, but um, uh, th from a Chinese angle, I mean, uh, Joseph Lee, for example, he, uh, he wrote a very interesting uh, socio-historical uh, analysis of uh, one community in Guangdong, uh, and um, what, what he found was that um, the, although you had priests, of course, you, th this was in the missionary era, so you had Western priests who were there, but, um, the, um, but, but you also had community leaders. And these community leaders, they were, uh, they were exactly the same ones who had been in charge of their clans, of their you know, large family, extended families for, for, for decades. So in other words, they were people of authority. And um, I think the missionaries would never have appointed somebody who uh, as a, a Jiao Zhang, or who they would not have uh, tolerated somebody as a Jiao Zhang who was a complete imposter, who had arrived, uh, had been, you know, traveling through a community or who was even persecuted, uh, prosecuted. I mean, uh, so um, they had to have uh, social legitimacy, legitimacy, and they also had to be uh, in the um, possession of uh, the credentials at the local level uh, in order to be able to. Um, uh, take decisions which the community respected. Um, because don't forget, for, for most of the time, there was no external missionary. So they had to get on with the rest of the group. And they had no uh, way of uh, implementing it by force. Because if they had made a, uh, if they had created a bloodshed, for example, between two communities, two neighboring communities, uh, then the Qing troops would have come, regardless of how, how far away that it was. So. Uh, they, they, in order to keep a low profile, in order to be able to stay beyond the uh, be, be, be beneath the radar of the uh, the um, uh, communities, uh, they needed to be very careful. It Thank was you. very very non-committal answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah that's, but, that's... but it's, it's true. They were they, they were both uh, they were both uh, socially uh, uh, you know accepted and so and 
religiously so well trained that they could actually also take on the role of, uh, of religious leaders. So they were almost clerical, uh, but mostly actually 70% social, 30% uh, 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 religious uh, in, in their leadership roles. That's what, how I see it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now, do we have any last questions? Because we have uh, gone on quite a long time with this fantastic uh, uh, discussion as well. But uh, let's see if there's uh, anyone else who wants to have one last question. Well, the people in Asia are in bed now. So it's the, yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay. So so I guess we'll stop here and thank. Uh, Lars, Dr. Laman, uh, uh, very, very much for this really excellent and, and very rich presentation.